With a rainbow of a thousand colors available at their fingertips, weaving brilliant, highly sought after Maya textiles, why would small groups of weavers in remote areas continue to produce white, translucent textiles? Water rushing down the northeastern slopes of Highland Chiapas heads towards the hot jungled areas where the Maya civilization originally developed in what is now northern Guatemala and the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico. It is in this area that we find archaeological evidence of ancient Maya translucent weaving. Christina Halperin studies Maya archaeological artifacts and textile representations on murals, ceramics, and stonework. According to Dr. Halperin, this is an example on a ceramic, which was probably produced at a site called Tikal in Guatemala. The woman wears a translucent textile drawn in a cross-hatching design which could suggest a gauze weave. It has a beautiful fringe embellishment and an open neckline. The long huipil is worn over a type of skirt and the upper torso is left bare underneath a translucent textile. She is a noblewoman from Tikal and is in a pose of dance in front of a Maya ruler from Motul de San Jose. We know from chemical analysis, as well as the writing, that this vessel is in the Ic style and was produced at or near the Motul de San Jose, capital of the Ic kingdom. The ceramic artisans from this site express themselves differently from the artisans of Tikal. Yet women at both sites are portrayed wearing gauze or open weave translucent textiles. According to Dr. Halperin, evidence of translucent weaves can be found from other sites. This vessel is probably produced in a region of northern Petén, under the domain of Calakmul, another powerful political entity in the Classic period. Calakmul and Tikal were arch enemies. Yet again, we have a woman with cross-hacked, scoop-necked, translucent huipil. Translucent textiles tend to be depicted on beautiful young women at the height of the reproductive years. Old women generally wear just a skirt and their upper bodies are uncovered. Dr. Halpern notes that pair dance scenes where the women are wearing translucent textiles may depict a type of betrothal. Translucent textiles can also be found in market scenes. There is a beautifully painted mural at the site of Calakmul in which women of different statuses are wearing translucent textiles. You can clearly see the body of the woman through the intricate blue textile. She commands the scene. But the other woman, who is likely selling goods in the market, is also wearing translucent textiles. So the textiles are marking a sense of femininity, while the elaborateness may denote status in this context.
Translucent textiles are also found in ritual depictions, according to Dr. Halperin. One mural at the site of Bonampak shows a number of women wearing plain, white translucent textiles while bloodletting. In another mural, they are in a scene of receiving tribute from visitors. Although many depictions of translucent textiles are on women, a few rare examples appear to be on men, Dr. Halperin points out. This example is a stone carving in which three subordinate figures are seated in front of a Bonampak lord, and you can see their hip cloths through the capes. This painted vessel further indicates that classic Maya men wear translucent textiles. It depicts a young Maya man wearing a hip wrap. His lower back silhouette is clearly visible through the translucent textile. The ancient depictions, as well as the archaeological evidence of both gauze and open weaves, are very similar to those that are produced today in Alta Verapaz and Chiapas. One of the main differences that we see, Dr. Halprin notes, is how widespread they probably were in the past. And how restricted they are now in terms of the communities that are producing these textiles. Textile fragments from the classic Maya era are rare. Thread fragments of a brocaded open plain weave were discovered at the archaeological site of Rio Azul in the 1980s and were authenticated at the University of Colorado Museum. Textile fragments of open plain weave brocade also were found in the Cueva del Lazo, located near Tuzla Gutierrez in Chiapas. The base cloth is an open, plain weave, similar to what is woven today in Alta Verapaz. Dark brown cotton was used for supplementary weft brocade to form the anthropomorphic face. Today, white brocade figures include geometric forms and figures. Pre-Columbian trade along the Pacific Rim of North, Central, and South America is well documented. Many cultures reaching the Pacific coast produced outstanding textiles that have survived to the present day. One of the most spectacular textiles is a Chimu tunic that survived due to the arid burial environment of coastal Peru. It includes brocaded pelican-like birds on a fine cotton base. Closer observation indicates that the birds are on rectangles of open plain weave, surrounded by rectangles of complex gauze weave. A photograph of the actual tunic shows extremely fine raw cotton thread, open weave and complex gauze weave segments, and inlaid supplementary weft brocading. Whether such weaving knowledge passed between ancient cultures through contact or by spontaneous discovery is a subject for further study. There is a unique example of an Indian noble depicted in Fuentes y Guzman's History of Guatemala written in the 1690s. The chronicler describes the cape as a fine transparent cotton weave. The drawing shows it with animal decorations. Textile expert Christina Doss points out a comparison could be made between the noble's cape and weaving done more recently in Alta Verapaz. 
this museum piece includes just such examples. Howard Hobson Tewksbury was a career Foreign Service officer. He served as a commercial attaché in Guatemala in the 1930s. The uncut huipil is full of fanciful animal brocades on a translucent textile. British archaeologist Alfred P. Maudsley and his wife Anne visited Guatemala in 1894. Two photographs prove his presence in Coban, the church on the main plaza and the plaza scene with more than a hundred Maya women in traditional white huipiles. Here is an uncut Picbil Huipil that dates to the 1890s, the era of the Maudsleys in Alta Verapaz. It includes geometric, anthropomorphic and botanical brocade designs and shows a style similar to what is still woven today. Guatemala textile collector Raymond Senek is most interested in early 20th century textiles he can date by the dyes used in the thread. That basically excludes traditional white weaves of Alta Vera Paz. However, his collection does include Maya textiles from the western highlands of interest here. This weaving shows a common practice at the time of using white brocade on a white open weave. Though using thicker thread and a tighter weave, this weeping also includes a white on white design. Three examples from Senek's collection use bands of white on white backgrounds as a horizontal design element. Here, a huipil, woven with a relaxed open weave, may be more akin to the open weaves in Alta Vera Paz than the tighter weaves of the Western Highlands today. Four early examples from Christina Doss's collection also show white brocade work on white backgrounds. Design motifs include animal, plant, and geometric forms similar to those still used today in Alta Vera Paz and elsewhere. Many museums have early 20th century examples of translucent textiles from Alta Vera Paz. The Perrin collection at the Phoebe Hearst Museum of Anthropology in Berkeley is said to date from 1902. The thread is soft, unprocessed, and hand-spun. Collections at the University of Pennsylvania's museum dating from the 1930s include this uncut repeat with a four-leafed brocade design still used today. Another includes animal and human figures among geometric forms. In an example from the Burke Museum in Seattle, the weaver uses plant forms, legs of beasts, and geometric forms in repetitive designs. Repetitive designs are also used in this uncut huipil. But let's look at the placement of the figure on the rump of a horse, not where you sit to actually ride a horse. The weaver seems more interested in equalizing the tension by keeping brocade elements spaced out across the row. Here is another example of weaver practicality. We see a horse-like animal with a geometric shape coming out of the middle of his back. Ah, say some, a clear depiction of Pegasus, but probably not. More likely, it's another example of inserting a shape to keep the tension equalized across the row. 
The first piece from this collection shows a tailored cut. Such tailoring did not catch on, as the open spaced weave tended to pull apart easily when cut. Human figures, birds and beasts appear as brocade designs in both open spaced piquebille weaving and in textiles with alternating rows of gauze weave and plain weave. In gauze weaves, the warps are twisted and held in place by the weft. Today, colorful polished threads are sometimes used in gauze weaves. Alta Vera Paz is a department in the north central area of Guatemala. There are six municipalities in Alta Vera Paz where translucent textiles are woven on backstrap looms. The red dot in the center is the city of Santo Domingo de Cobán. Cobán is both the capital of Alta Vera Paz and the administrative head of the large municipality of Cobán. First, a visit to Santo Domingo de Cobán. Cobán has for centuries been the religious center of the department. White huipiles are more in evidence during religious celebrations than at other times, but most now are cut from Asian cloth. Vendor Maria Luisa dug up a traditional city of Coban huipil with fully racked deer and a duck on its back. Coban Central Plaza is on the top of a hill, with views beyond in most directions. Older establishments offer charming architectural details, handwoven linen, and hidden gardens. The Agricultural Cooperative of Samak, west of Coban, has a cluster of weavers studied since 2005. It starts getting hot when the foggy mist burns off and shade becomes a welcome relief. Alta Verapaz was never conquered by the Spanish, but was pacified later by Catholic friars and the cross. From late 19th century, Alta Vera Paz became a coffee-producing region run by German immigrants. The tombstones of Gustavo and Anna Roth Helmrich rest on a hill overlooking the remains of their homestead and a tiny chapel. Immigrant German women greatly admired and collected the lace-like translucent textiles woven by Kikchimaya women. Samak and nearby Sanintaka agricultural cooperatives became viable after the 1960 to 96 civil war. Men worked the land. Women who remembered how to weave helped others learn or relearn the craft. Grade schools began appearing in rural areas after the 1996 peace accord. Girls and boys are now encouraged to attend at least a few years of school. A backstrap loom is just thread, twine, and a pile of sticks. Only an expert can release its potential. The sword or batten size and heft suggest it was used for heavy, tight weaving. This loom belonged to a master weaver in Samak. The translucent style weaving in process is called pikbil, which means picked. After commercial thread became available in the early 1900s, the thread used for translucent weaving in Alta Vera Paz eventually became unpolished cotton, size 20, one ply. Setting up a backstrap loom for translucent weaving is a time-consuming process involving many hands. First, 
Candelaria measures out the thread on a calibrated warping board. Then, warp threads are starched for strength, using mashed up tortillas in hot water. And finally, Amalia and Candelaria arrange the warps on loom sticks. Aura builds a fire to help dry out the warps on a damp day. Today, there are about 40 backstrap weavers in Samak. Half weave the traditional translucent style. Individual weavers and small groups in Samak have succeeded in selling a few textiles in Antigua or Guatemala City. Amalia Gue has participated for several years in the folk art market in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Weavers come in all ages. The brocade designs they favor are many. Creativity flourishes in Samak. Picbil weavers of Samak use brocade designs of animals, plants, human figures, stars, and geometric designs. Sometimes they repeat one design across a row. Other times they make a lattice pattern with a brocade design in each enclosure. With the emphasis now on selling, some weavers are using larger designs and more colorful thread, both hand-dyed and commercial. Commercially treated and blended threads are stronger, thicker and stiffer, but translucency is usually lost in the process. Reaching the sunken crater of Sanintaka, eight kilometers past Samak, may not be an easy task. A day in Sanintaka can include extremes in both weather and road conditions. The Sanintaka Agricultural Cooperative was formalized after the 36-year civil war. It is made up of Kekchi Maya people who survived some of the worst violence and displacement of the conflict. Near the store Tienda Rosita is a memorial to local war victims of a 1982 massacre. Both men and women are named. Don Chus is one of several Sanimtaka leaders who have worked ceaselessly to strengthen the new cooperative. That leadership has resulted in a strong membership and the construction of buildings, greenhouses, storage facilities, and ponds. Coffee and cardamom prices are down, according to Don Chus. But the co-op is finding other solutions and remains strong. The school now offers the first three grades of primary. Sanimtaka is an extremely clean community. Everyone in Sanimtaka is encouraged to protect the environment and not litter. Road improvements now allow truck access to the bottom of the crater relieving the necessity of physically carrying everything in on their backs. By 2014, a church was under construction, following a massive flood that swept away eight families, homes and crops. Sturdy new roofs appear, and new construction is evident. Families work their own plots on the hillsides to provide beans and corn for tortillas. 
Some men participate in temporary worker programs in Canada and return with knowledge and money they put into their homes and community. There's still a lot left to do, says Don Chus. That's true, but they have come a long way together since the Civil War. Now a look at what the women weave. Most weaving in Sanimtaka today is done in hopes of selling for needed cash, rather than for personal use. Most weavers now wear weepil-shaped blouses cut from Asian yardage, sold in every market. For many decades, the best pikpil weaver in Sanimtaka was Rosario Coipop, affectionately known as Kana, or Grandma Rouge. For decades, she taught endless numbers of weavers of both Samak and Sanimtaka. The elegant, translucent pikpil weaving style survived after the Civil War in the municipality of Coban to a great extent because Rosario and her daughters willingly taught any woman who made it to her humble door. Backstrap weaving in Sanimtaka is done in many styles, including translucent ones. An abundance of brocade designs are used, from simple to complex. They include animals, human figures, plants, arches, common objects, and geometric forms. While the brocade designs have names in Kekchi, or descriptions in Spanish, what they actually mean is another matter. Some weavers today say they don't know the meaning. Some say a teacher told them what it meant, but they forgot. Meaning seems to have been lost over the centuries as new designs were added. Color is increasingly popular with young weavers, but translucency is lost with thicker commercial thread. Very young girls sometimes wear wipiles made of leftover thread. Weavers, however, rarely wear handwoven wipiles anymore. It may be sadly prophetic that in this photo of Sanintaka weavers, none of them seem to be wearing traditional handwoven pikpil wipiles. San Cristobal Verapaz is known for its church high on a hill overlooking a lake, a covered market, and lots of shops. The market sells wipiles made of commercial yardage from Asia, as well as backstrap loomed textiles. Nearby, a tailor finishes the neck of a new wipil. Weaver Paulina lives in the aldea of Baleo. She learned to weave in the last two years. Paulina is weaving her first wipil in a calado style, which requires the use of several heddle sticks. Rosalia Asigcho, a cooperative facilitator, is well received in the area. High on a hill overlooking the town of Taktik and the surrounding municipality is El Calvario Church. It brings back painful childhood memories to master weaver Flora Schock. Learning to weave as a seven-year-old was not a choice. Her Pokomchi Maya mother beat her hands raw and jammed them into anthills when her weaving skills lagged. When her first decrepit weaving was finished, her mother dragged her up to the church to beg the holy statue for sellable weavings. 
Doña Flora survived both her mother and an abusive husband to become the sole support of her family by using her weaving skills. She can and will weave anything for anyone on a backstrap loom in order to maintain her family. In about the year 2000, her hands were getting really tired doing taktik style weaving all the time. She wanted occasionally to work on a less stressful style of weaving, such as bikbil, the translucent, spaced plain weave with brocaded designs. One morning, she got on a bus in Taktik, went to Coban, continued on to the San Pedro Carcha market, and there bought a big peel to use as a pattern. The wipil she bought is expertly woven, with matched panels and perfectly spaced brocade designs. But exactly where it was woven will never be known. And the original meaning of the brocaded symbols is no longer certain. Doña Flora used this wipil as a pattern for years to weave black ones for mourning or white ones for everyday wear. She sold them to her neighbors or anyone else who wanted them, even though they are not the traditional style of the Pocomchi Maya of Taktik. The rural aldea of Pansinic is just a short ride from the town of Taktik. There, Esperanza leads a group making calado or gauze weave textiles for a European export organization. 19-year-old Lilian weaves an aqua pastel shawl, but wears an exquisite wipil woven by her mother. Her 13-year-old sister Gloria weaves a fuchsia-colored calado, but wears a wipil she wove when she was eight. The group has a contract with Chilam in the Netherlands. Chilam requires exact measurements and provides the thread to be used. Europe has stringent rules about chemicals used in threads and avoids genetically modified seed products. On revisiting Pansinic in 2010, Gloria is weaving a taktik style we peel panel, but it is what she is wearing that astounds. Her we peel is made of two panels, not the usual three, and the alternating rows of calado and plain weave are vertical, not horizontal. Gloria had decided at the last minute to attend a school party. Her mother only had two of the three panels finished, so she put the wipil together with the panels she had by changing the orientation. It remains to be seen if the vertical style will catch on. Further east from Taktik, and at a lower altitude, is Tamau. There we find other weavers making shawls similar to those of the Pansinic group. The weaving style is alternating bands of gauze or calado between open plain weave with simple geometric brocade designs. The colors are all pastel. A traditional tamau design includes vertical zigzags, like these two wipiles. The municipality of San Juan Chamelco is dwarfed in size by the municipalities of Coban and San Pedro Carcha. The town of San Juan Chamelco is also the seat of the municipality. Rosalia Sicol owns a thread shop across from the market building. 
Weavers from the bottom of the craters and the top of the mountains know her well-stocked shop. She and her staff are a fountain of information about weaving and embroidery in the area. In the market building of San Juan Chamelco, Juanita embroiders while tending her baby, asleep in a box. Juanita purchased the Piquilhuipil to embroider. Mercedes is weaving a panel with alternating bands of calado or gauze weave and open plain weave. She says the brocaded birds are roosters, gallos. Translucent weaving, whether gauze or open plain weave, is a quiet activity. Tighter weaves with thicker thread require a more forceful motion with a sword or batten. Mercedes weaves a three-panel weepil to sell, but wears a commercial cloth weepil with embroidered neck and sleeve bands. The weepil she weaves will sell for 50 quetzales, $6.24. The embroidered one she wears cost 150 quetzales, $18.73. Her mother's wheat deal of commercial yardage cost 80 quetzales, $9.99. Maria Alejandrina also weaves only to sell to a vendor in the market who pays her 35 or 40 quetzales for a huipil, just under $5. She is weaving with mish, a thicker thread than is normally used for traditional piquil textiles, though she still calls the style piquil. Es diferente, es como serpiente. No, es uh, arco. arco. A textile observer says Maria is weaving a serpent design, but Maria says they are arches. Maria also embroiders for money. Elvira lives alone outside San Juan Chamelco. She tells us that she had been forced to care for her parents all their lives. A suitor she loved was refused by her parents, which she still deeply regrets. Elvira is weaving a bright red panel for a huipil. She estimates it will take her six weeks to weave the three required panels due to her poor eyesight. She plans to sell the huipil for 150 quetzales, $18.73. Elvira is using a turkey bone pick to keep the rough cotton threads from sticking together. The rural aldea of Santa Cecilia is located just outside the town of San Juan Chamelco. Here, Maria Elena, a widowed weaver, is interviewed by anthropologist Barbara Noki. Maria Elena notes that her grandmother wore piquilhuipiles all the time, but that she herself only wears them to religious services. For the heat, she likes to wear tzubil, which is what she calls the calado, or gauze-weave-style huipil, she is wearing. She says many women today like to use commercial yardage for their huipiles because it is less expensive than hand-loomed ones. Pues lo, lo que te estoy contando ahora es que ya solo es la tela que viene de, o sea, de lo que hacen, no sé de dónde, porque yo miro que allá en Chameco solo es le compra. Tela comercial, ah, ah, bueno. Ajá, sí. 
Ajá. les gusta más la tela ¿Sí? que compran en la tienda. Sí, porque es un poco barato. Entonces por eso le compro Ajá. esto. Le encuentro a 20. A 15. La yarda. Ajá. A 20 que te sale Ajá. la yarda. Ajá. A 15 que te sale la yarda. Le llamas. Maria Elena weaves both gauze weave and pig bee styles for sale. She uses a variety of thread, traditional unpolished cotton, polished cotton, and synthetic mixes, whatever will sell. This pattern that she has here is called chop which means pineapple. Earning money is essential for Maria Elena to buy food and medicines and to send her daughter to primary school. In the aldea of San Luis, San Juan Chamelco, Maria Candelaria had a rough upbringing, similar to Doña Flora in Taktik. She was 10 when she learned to weave. Her mother was brutal to her, hitting her hands if she made mistakes, and sticking her hands in anthills to punish her for poor weaving. She remembers that all her mother wanted was to sell weavings as they were desperate for money. Doña Candelaria is now a master of many weaving styles. She also embroiders. Doña Candelaria's own daughter, Marlene, is also a fine weaver. Doña Candelaria speaks only Quechi, never went to school, and can't read or write. Younger members of her family speak Spanish well, and one of her sons is a school teacher. The agricultural cooperative of Sebob is found by going south from San Juan Chamelco and turning east just before a mountain range. After an increasingly rough ride, the road dead ends at a small mountain. Employees at the thread shop in San Juan Chamelco said that translucent weavers live in this area. Though the climb to reach them on top of a bigger mountain is a surprise. Maria has finished a calado huipil with alternate bands of gauze weave and open plain weave. Some call the brocaded birds turkeys. Angelina is an accomplished pigbil weaver. Some call her complex design pacaya, a palm tree fruit eaten at Easter. Weavers gather in the mottled shade. Here, Angelina is working on a pikbil weaving with brocaded arches. Marta weaves a pikbil panel using small brocade designs. Dominga is weaving a white calado or gauze weave with alternating bands of colorful brocaded birds on plain weave. Albertina is weaving a piece not frequently seen of calado and simple weave and Claudia is brocading white traditional designs into a dark blue background. To get to the aldea of Campat, you travel south from the town of San Juan Chamelco and east into the mountains. The rough road climbs up and down past limestone caves and small agricultural enterprises. The distant wail of a conch shell calls co-op members down from the surrounding mountains. (laughs) 
Doña Candelaria from San Luis is the guide. The weavers are her relatives. In the shade of a corrugated roof, Odilia finishes an elegant piquebil textile, the last of three panels for a huipil. Odilia did not learn to weave piquebil as a child, but rather two years ago at the age of 21. Her weaving has four salvages, the mark of an accomplished traditional weaver when executed to perfection. <coughs> She uses a bone pick and a small batten to work the space. She continues the inlaid brocade design in the termination area by feeding the supplementary weft threads through the narrow opening in the warp threads that are raised by the heddles. In spite of the decreasing space available, she continues the brocade designs perfectly. The finished textile shows the expertise of this young weaver. Carmelina also is finishing the third panel for a pic bil huipil with exacting perfection. She says it took her a month to make the three panels for the huipil. Elvira, or Doña Vir, is Carmelina's mother. This uncut huipil shows her expert weaving with brocade designs of animals, human figures, and arches. Odilia added the skirts. Both men speak Spanish and translate from Quechi. The textiles are washed, dried, and delivered the next day. The last place in Alta Verapaz related to translucent textiles is San Pedro Carcha. San Pedro Carcha is a market town. Collectors often lack information on where a textile was made and by whom. Weavers will sell their textiles through trusted relatives or contacts, no matter the distance involved. This is from an uncut three-panel weepy of alternating bands of complex gauze weave and plain weave with brocaded ducks. The thread is doubled, reducing the translucency of the brocaded bands. The panels were carefully matched as she wove, and she skillfully finished off the end selvage of each panel. The unknown weaver could be from anywhere in Alta Verapaz. The second example from the San Pedro Carcha market was originally purchased by the master weaver Flora Schock of Taktik. On a young female body, the translucency of piquebil weaving can still be said to be provocative and reflect its classic Maya-era use as body decoration rather than body covering. Now a visit to the Tzotzil Maya of Chiapas, Mexico. Tzotzil weavers of translucent textiles are found in the municipality of Venustiano Carranza. Carranza is located on a hot plateau in an area now dominated by cane fields, sugar mills, and cattle ranges in southwestern Chiapas. Carranza shirts and huipiles of the past were semi-translucent, as these three examples show. Today, there are very few weavers willing to weave a fine translucent textile. Now they weave translucent textiles only for collectors or for contests, which were started after the 1994 Zapatista uprising in Chiapas. They all seem to follow the same guidelines, use the same designs, and the same split commercial thread. At a Carranza home, a visitor who weaves all Tzotzil styles 
share some textile history. Rosa calls the translucent style Petit, the Tzotzil Maya word for spindle whirl. But the term Petit now is used ubiquitously for many Tzotzil weavings, whether translucent or not. Porque hasta yo me, me, me ponen a trabajar. Primero lo hacemos así, los algodoncitos. Ya están empacados los algodoncitos, ya empezamos a, ¿sí? Ya empezamos a, a hacer con el pete, con unas bolitas. Pero ya no. Ahorita pues ya no, porque ya no, ya no hay algodón. Antes pues lo, lo, lo sembraban los, los viejitos, los maridos. Es el trabajo que tenía. Ahora pues ya no es muy lo hace. Ya no, ya no lo sembran. Sí, ahorita pues ya, ya hay este facilidad porque ya compramos el hilo. Antes porque no había. Yo tengo mi traba, ya es puro PT, estoy haciendo, es de los finitos. Pero no lo traje por lo que es delicado para traerlo. ¿Cómo se vende aquí? ¿En tubos? Oh. Eso sí, se venden en cono. Este, este hacemos, cuando lo hacemos, así lo unimos ahí en el palito y se entra a coser en el juego con atol, con atol de maíz bien finito. De este hilo. Porque antes, en antepasado, lo hacían con algodón, puro algodón. Pero ahora ya lo usamos de esta, de fábrica. Pero lo dos. hacemos en dos. Ya se hace en dos, por eso ya se ve bien finito. Y ya lo hacemos con atol. Cocido en el atol. Correcto. Sí. Y ya así que sale en el juego cocido, ya lo hacemos así, deshilachado. Por hebrita, hebrita, porque sale bien tieso el hilo. Para que se endurezca un poco. <risa> por eso este es bien costoso, la chula. A few weavers of the style live in the large municipality in Paraíso del Grijalva. One of these weavers is Katarina, who also weaves many Tzotzil styles. Sí, ahora pienso hacer uno, pero me lleva meses para hacer. Una vez sí se me llevó este nueve meses para hacerlo. Y ahora quiero hacer otra vez, pero como hay necesidad, pues vamos haciendo eso. Como de eso sale más luego, pues, que el hecho en petetia y nos lleva meses. Y por eso casi no lo, no lo hace, nadie, casi nadie lo hace, solo cuando es encargo lo, hace, lo hacemos. Porque ese hilito se revienta mucho. Al hacerlo, al tejerlo, se revienta mucho el hilo. Por eso es que. Que es 100% algodón. algodón, sí, el de Petet. También este es de algodón, pero este es, este es más gruesito que el hilo. <coughs> y el de Petet es este, más delgadito. Y eh, no se puede tejer en la noche, porque por el frío se, se pega en el hilo al hacerlo. ¿Y el Petet es hecho hilado a mano o controlado? Este es hilado a mano, todo Petet. hecho a mano. Pero yo, como yo no lo sé este, deshilar, lo, lo pago para que me deshilen el hilo cuando lo hago. Antonia is another Paraíso del Grijalva weaver who will spend months weaving a fine translucent textile with split commercial thread for a contest. Lo voy a meter. She hopes to win a 40,000 peso prize, 
which is over 3,000 US dollars. She won first place in a previous contest with a fine translucent shawl. Angela runs the weavers group Artesanías Jalabel from her house in the city of Carranza. They offer fine translucent shirts, shawls and huipiles, as well as more standard items. Both Angela and her daughter-in-law Maria Concepcion weave all Tzotzil styles. So, se le pone gallinitas o patitos que no llevan pata. Sin pata son los patitos y esas son los, las gallinas. Van encima de los arquitos. Mm -hmm. Este otro son turuletes con gotitas. Estos son turuletes rellenados. El arquito que es este, la milpita. Este se le llama hueso de pescado. Va que el choy en nuestro idioma tzotzil es hueso de pescado en español. Este es arquito también, pero son de puros, puras gotitas de turulete. Angela and Conchita affirm that all Venustiano Carranza weavers of the fine translucent style use exactly the same thread. Another talented Carranza weaver is Eloisa. Here she is working on a ceremonial scarf or pañuela used by Tzotzil men on their heads or around their shoulders. Eloisa has included split white commercial thread in the weaving because she has extra available. The brocade symbols include figure eights in chains, cups, brocaded forms, roses, and combs. Eloisa estimates there are only about five women who occasionally weave the fine translucent retro style. The brocade designs she uses are surprisingly similar to other translucent weavers in the area. They include earth or arches, plants or pine trees, water, rain, thunder and the sun, though there are variations in name, shape and order from weaver to weaver. Eloisa uses a maguey cactus spine to separate the threads. It also holds the tenter stick. She notes the difficulties of weaving with the split commercial thread and the need to use bands of unaltered threads on edges of the panel to make it stronger. Eloisa is one who knows how to split commercial thread for weaving the fine translucent style. Eloisa and her daughter Ana Luisa demonstrate how the commercial thread is split to make the fine thread used for translucent textiles. First, Ana Luisa unspins the two ply thread. Meanwhile, Eloisa carves a spindle and inserts it into a clay whorl. Then, Eloisa takes the spindle and whorl that Anna has been working with. She splits the two ply thread and ties one split thread to her newly carved spindle and whorl for her left hand. She grasps the apparatus from Anna with her left foot and a split thread from it with her right foot. Then she winds one split thread onto her right hand while spinning the other split thread onto the spindle with her left hand. 
Es bien máquina, mi hermano. The thread on her right hand will be spun onto another spindle at a later time. For splitting the thread for other weavers, Eloisa makes 150 pesos, just under 12 US dollars per 4,000 meter cone. She says it takes months to split enough thread to make a fine translucent style huipil or shirt. This fine translucent huipil is woven with split commercial thread. A close-up photo shows reflections from the mercerization process. Double Dyra size 30 two-ply thread is used for the horizontal and vertical design lines. Split Iris 30 two-ply thread form the simple plain weave. A different fine translucent textile shows the two-ply thread as it comes from the cone used for about 30 edge warps. The rest of the warps and all of the wefts are split threads. Splitting commercial thread to achieve translucency is a technique that has been around since commercial thread appeared in Mexico. It is not indicative, however, of what the Tzotzil wear today, as the end result is too fragile for common wear and beyond their means. A few elderly can be found at religious festivals wearing the old, white, semi-translucent style of decades past. The vast majority of Sotzil, if not already switching to jeans and t-shirts, are content to wear white or colorful garments that continue the old brocade designs, but that are no longer translucent. Translucent textiles were first depicted on classic Maya murals, carved stone, and painted pottery more than a thousand years ago. The Maya civilization covered the Yucatan Peninsula and most of what is Chiapas and Guatemala today. Maya women traditionally have produced a white spaced weave decorated with rows of white brocaded designs. Today, there are hundreds of women scattered throughout the mountains of Alta Verapaz who continue to weave translucent textiles for sale and wear. Few belong to organized weavers' groups. In Carranza, however, there are less than 10 women who weave the fine translucent textiles today, and only for contests and collectors. There are two main types of translucent weaving in Alta Vera Paz today, picbil, or spaced weave with brocade designs, and calado, or gauze weave. Both are found in classic Maya art. In Alta Vera Paz, brocade designs are chosen by the individual weaver. The number of brocade designs and variations seems endless. Relocations following the peace accord may have increased the available options by bringing in new designs. In Carranza, the brocade designs have little variation from weaver to weaver. Some brocade designs used in both locations are similar, though they may have a different name. Plants come, with or without a bird on top, in both locations. They are sometimes called pine trees in Carranza. These are called arches in Alta Vera Paz, and arches or landforms in Carranza. 
Domestic birds are brocaded in both locations. Horses, deer and dogs appear on Alta Vera Pasquipiles. Dogs used to be on Carranza Huipiles. Now they can be sometimes found on fine Carranza shirts. In Alta Vera Paz, human beings were generic until about 40 years ago, when skirts began appearing on some. Today, male and female sometimes appear in the same line, holding hands. In Carranza, they are generally considered men. The comb design can be found on huipiles in Alta Vera Paz and on men's scarves in Carranza. Other designs used in both areas include figure eights, as seen in the weaving in progress, and in the teaching swatch. Some weavers call the design rings. In Carranza, figure eights form a continuous line according to the weaver of this textile. The brocade design for the sun is found in both locations. Thunder and rain designs often appear below the sun in Carranza. And the cup design is often used between sun designs. Star designs are unique to Alta Vera Paz Huipiles, though sometimes called pineapples. Crab, pacaya fruit, and leaf designs are also unique to the area. In both locations, Maya weavers may know the name, but not the meaning of designs they have used for years. Some Alta Vera Paz weavers of translucent textiles wear hand-woven picpil or calado huipiles. Others wear Asian cloth that curiously mimics the translucency of the past. In Carranza, weavers tend to wear tzotzil maya textiles that are colorful and sturdy. Though translucency is a thing of the past, traditional brocade designs flourish. Loom panels in Alta Vera Paz are between 12 and 14 inches wide, 31 to 36 centimeters. It takes three panels to make a huipil with ample arm overhang. In Carranza, loom panels are between 23 and 25 inches wide, 59 to 64 centimeters. It takes only one panel to make a huipil with little shoulder overhang, which is their style. In Alta Vera Paz, since the mechanization of spinning, the thread most often used in translucent textiles has been the same. It is a soft, non-mercerized, size 20, one-ply thread, purchase in skeins. In Carranza, for at least the past 35 years, the thread used for all fine translucent textiles has been split commercial thread. Specifically, iris size 30, two-ply mercerized thread, purchased on 4,000 meter cones. Translucent textiles are worn only by females in Alta Vera Paz. In Carranza, semi-translucent textiles were woven from raw cotton until the middle of the last century. Now, however, the locally worn style is colorful, sturdy, and made with thick commercial thread. The fine translucent style is made only by a few weavers for contests and collectors and is not worn locally due to its fragility and cost. Both Kekchi and Sotzil children now have access to at least a primary school education. Young Maya girls in both areas are less likely than their mothers to think of themselves only as future weavers. In Chiapas, government scholarships to university are available for children of weavers. 
some Maya girls now aim to be teachers, nurses, and even engineers. While horizons are expanding for all Maya, we can only hope that some of the beauty of their unique past will continue to accompany them.